Okay, um, I wanted to say a little bit about the rest of the reading in Unit 1 from uh, Fred Feldman, from this book, uh, Confrontations with the Reaper, that you have um, PDFs of on Blackboard. Um, and the reason I, I wanted to make a little video is because from the few people who contact me, uh, I see that people are still struggling a little bit with um, what's going on, what he's trying to do. Um, so I'll say, I'll try and make that a little bit clearer, try and make it a little bit more intuitive. I think he does write clearly, but maybe it's just so um, philosophical or, you know, he's still using a bit of jargon from the philosophers use that makes it harder for someone who's not familiar with philosophy talk to get into. So, let's um, talk a little bit about the chapters, uh, three chapters that I haven't talked about. Life functional theories of life, vitalist uh, functionals, uh, theories of life, and the enigma of death. Okay, so, in the two chapters with life in the title, He's trying to get closer to a working definition for what it is to be alive. Um, and I said a little bit about definitions in the previous little video that I did. Uh, but let me um, let me give you a, a little background anecdote that sort of encapsulates what uh, Feldman is trying to do here. Um, if you ever take Philosophy 101, uh, Intro to Philosophy, no doubt one of the first things that you will do is read one of the dialogues of Plato. Now Plato is uh, widely considered to be one of the all-time great philosophers, and he's an ancient Greek philosopher, lived um, a couple of centuries BC, uh, I don't remember dates, and um, he wrote almost entirely in dialogue form. That is, it looked like a little play. If you read it, it's got, you know, the, the name of the character and then what they say and then another character and so on. In practically every single one of his dialogues, the main character is Socrates, and Socrates was Plato's teacher and another great philosopher in his own right. But Socrates never wrote anything down. Um, so we only know what he said via what Plato tells us and a couple of other people who weren't as sympathetic but Plato in general who very much admired Socrates and followed Socrates and Plato became his own philosopher and, and the later dialogues of Plato still have the figure of Socrates in them but uh, it's pretty much agreed that Socrates now is just a mouthpiece for Plato. However, the early dialogues uh, Socrates is this figure, I used to make this analogy of, who's, of what Socrates is like. Uh, he's like Columbo, but nowadays nobody knows who the hell Columbo is. Columbo uh, was a TV detective played by the great Peter Falk, who many of you might know as the grandpa in Princess Bride. Um, but uh, P uh, Columbo's character, uh, the show Columbo, it was different from most detective shows in that uh, in most detective shows you don't know who committed the crime and the show is about catching who did it and working out who did it. Whereas in Columbo you actually see the first like half hour of the show is watching the person commit the crime and Columbo only shows up later in the show. Uh, so you know who did it. Uh, and they do it and they cover it up and they think they've got an airtight alibi and then along comes Columbo and he looks like a buffoon. He's this scruffy little guy, uh, drives a scruffy car, sometimes has his scruffy dog with him, this big basset hound, um, totally inept, doesn't carry a gun because as he said he, he wouldn't be able to shoot it, not heroic at all. Um, and looks looks like an idiot, you know, he's always asking, uh, saying, I'm confused, you know, I this doesn't make sense to me, please explain this to me. And what the, the uh, murderer usually um, does is they say, oh, well, it's very simple, you know, this happened, and they lay out the story that they've concocted to cover up their crime. And Columbus says, ah, 
that makes perfect sense. You're right, it must be that. And they think, well, I fooled him. And then he, it just he's walking out the room, he turns around and he says, there's just one thing. And he asks a question that pinpoints a flaw in their whole uh, story. And they realize, oh crap, this guy is on to me. And the rest of the, um, the rest of the show is him getting closer and closer until he nails them. Well, Socrates is a bit like that. Socrates also, scruffy, smelly guy, hangs out, but he used to hang out in, in Athens, in ancient Athens, in the market square, kind of buttonholing uh, puffed up individuals, people, important people in Athens, who at, went around acting like they knew what was what. Nowadays, they'd be politicians. And he would go up to them and say, you seem to know a lot. You, you go around saying you know a lot. Help me out, because I don't know anything. Uh, I really don't know anything. Uh, and I want you to teach me what you know about, and there's a whole, depending on the dialogue, it's a different important concept. So for example, uh, one of the famous early dialogues is a dialogue called the Youth of Rho. Uh, and then the topic is the correct attitude to, wait, to take towards the gods. The usual translation is piety. But we could also think of it as morality. What, what is it to be moral? What is right standard of conduct? And it's called the Euthyphro because the, uh, the character that he buttons holes is called Euthyphro. I mean, all the dialogues are basically named after the main character who isn't Socrates. They can't be named after the main character, otherwise they'd all be called Socrates. Anyway, so um, what Socrates does is he approaches someone and, they, and says, what is, you know, fill in the blank, in this case, piety? And they say, oh, it's very simple, Socrates, it's this. And they give a definition. And then he says, well, wait a minute, though. There's a problem with that definition. And he does almost exactly what uh, Feldman does in these chapters. So there's sort of a back and forth. Um, Euthyphro will pre present a definition of piety. Uh, as for example, what is pious is what is loved by the gods, plural, because this is ancient Greek and Greece and they have a, a bunch of gods. And uh, the first objection Socrates has is, but wait a minute, there's a lot of gods and they're always arguing and there's hardly anything that they all love. Uh, or, or actually, what if I pick one of them and say this is loved by, uh, you know, Zeus, but of course it's hated by... Ares or something like that. Uh, does that mean that it's pious because it's loved by one of the gods? But then, you know, they all love, uh, just about anything would be covered because somebody, some of the gods bound, bound to love that uh, something. So right there, he's pointed to, f to a flaw with the definition and it has to be fixed. Uh, but what always happens is the person keeps trying to fix it and keeps trying to fix it until they tie themselves in knots and they say, Oh, look at the time I got to be going, uh, you know, and they go off in a huff. Uh, Socrates did this so much that eventually all the people he would buttonhole got so pissed off, they had him accused on trumped up charges, and famously he was sentenced to death and had to drink poison. Um, so, uh, you know, philosophy can be bad for your health, particularly if you're rather annoying about it. Um, but don't worry, he was like, in his 70s at the time. So he had a good life and, and pretty much he, he took the poison to make them regret what they've done because he could have escaped and the usual thing is his friends would bribe the guards but he refused to take that way out because he was principal. Anyway, that's the background. Uh, Socrates is sort of the archetypal philosopher who picks away at things and he says, no, look, I, it's really important to me to understand this stuff. People use words that's one of the things uh, that I think makes philosophy important. People do use words without really knowing what they mean. And it is important to know what something means, uh, particularly, as I said in the last video, uh, words that have legal implications. And life and death have very important legal definitions. Um, uh, let me see, I've got an anecdote uh, from when I first arrived in this country. I had to share an apartment with a guy, this was in Los Angeles, uh, where a, with a guy who worked for um, this organization that froze people. You've probably heard of this, it's called Cryonics. 
uh, one of the rumours is that Walt Disney is frozen somewhere. Uh, I don't think he is. Ted Williams, his head is frozen because if you can't afford the whole body, you just get your head frozen. And the, the point of this is it's supposed to be a way to achieve immortality through technology. You know, you're dying, uh, modern technology can't save you, but future technology might be able to save you. So save, freeze your body so that it doesn't rot or degrade, and then we, the plan is in the future when they've perfected technology like little nano robots that can go inside your body and fix it, they'll fix it and revive you. Uh, and if you can't afford the whole body, just get your head frozen because they'll give you a robot body when when uh, when you defrost. If you ever watch the cartoon Futurama, they're always having figures from the past in little their heads are in tanks and they've got little robot bodies. I remember they had the Beastie Boys or, and Nixon. Uh, okay, so people actually do this. They they want to achieve immortality through technology, so they pay to have their their heads frozen or bodies frozen. Well. Um, some little old lady who lived in Los Angeles paid for this service. She died, and if you pay for this service, you have a little wristband with the phone number on, and they, you know, your family calls the number as soon as possible. These people from this organization that was called Alcor come around really fast. In this case, cut your head off, and the guy whose apartment I was sharing held the head as it was being cut off, which made me a little worried. He was otherwise a nice guy, you know. Always paid for the toilet paper. Uh, but, you know, they cut the head off and, and froze it. But the trouble was they hadn't waited for a death certificate before they did this. So, you know, headless corpse and the police got interested. And they demanded to see the head because they wanted to do an autopsy on it. But, of course, if they did an autopsy on it, they would cut up the brain and the poor little old lady's wishes would not be granted and there'd be no hope for immortality for her. So my my roommate and his corporation hid the head um, from the police. All of this because there was some question as to whether or not she was dead when they sawed off the head. Uh, and that issue had to be settled because, you know, it's not so bad to saw the heads off death, dead people, but sawing the heads off live people is a bit of a no-no. Okay, so life and death, important legal com concepts. They need to be settled. People use the, the terms as if they understand them, but Feldman said, Feldman is being like Socrates here, and he's saying, I, I'm not sure we really do understand them. Let's, let's see, what, see if we can um, test various popular approaches. And the reason why there are two different chapters, the life functional and the vitalist chapters, is because there are two major approaches to what life is. The life functional uh, approach is to say something is living, alive if it can do certain things. And this is, you know, a pretty common sense idea. Uh, why is it... I mean, imagine if you go to a an alien planet and there's stuff that moves. You say, have I found something alive? Well, you'd be tempted to think that because it's moving. And that seems to be a thing that... Uh, that is indicative of life. Unless, of course, you know, there are certain kinds of movement that we, we don't think indicate life, like, you know, a flowing river or something like that. But if it's moving, if it's also reproducing, both of these seem to be features of living things. So the life functional approach is to suggest that there are certain things that if you can do them, certain functions that if you can perform them, that's an indication that you're alive. Uh, the trouble is, as Feldman proceeds to show in this chapter, there doesn't seem to be any particular set of functions that really are distinctive of only living things. And here I might uh, expand a little bit on uh, cr the criteria of definitions. There's a very important distinction in philosophy and it's related to the distinction between too broad and too narrow that I talked about in the last video. But it's to do with conditions for something. Uh, now that's very vague and I'll, I'll try and make it clear, but um, there are two kinds of conditions. There's necessary condition and sufficient condition. Okay, let's explain what I mean. A sufficient condition for something else, A is a sufficient condition for B, means having A guarantees that you already have B. Now, for example, 
being a whale, suppose you are a whale, that's a sufficient condition for being a mammal. Why? Because being a whale guarantees automatically that you are a mammal. There are no reptile whales. So um, that's what it is for something to be sufficient for another. It's enough by itself to guarantee the second thing. Okay, so that's a sufficient condition. So it would be nice if we could find a, a, a group of functions such that if you perform these functions, that's sufficient for you being alive. Now, can we do that? Well, what about movement? Is moving enough to guarantee that you're alive? Well, no. As I've just said, a, a, a river moves, the planets move, and we hope to God they're not alive. I'm sure there are plenty of science fiction stories where it turns out the planet is alive, uh, but I, I don't think we hope, uh, you know, planets in general are alive, and yet they all move. They, they move around um, the, the stars they're in orbit of. Um, so mo movement by itself is not sufficient, and you can show this again with a counter example. You can come up with something that moves but is not alive, and if you can do that, that shows that movement is not sufficient. Being something that moves doesn't guarantee that you're alive. Okay, the other kind of condition is necessary, um, and again we're familiar with this word and it means basically what, what we know it means. Uh, a is a necessary condition for B, means you can't have B without A. So, for example, um, we would say uh, having gas in your tank is a necessary condition for your car starting, because your car is not going to start without gas in your tank. I'm assuming nobody has an electric car, because, you know, you don't, do you? Maybe in a few years you will, but, you know, I. I don't think anybody's driving a Nissan Leaf, at least not in Flint, Michigan. Um, okay, so having gas in your tank is necessary for your car starting, because your car is not going to start without the gas in the tank. However, having gas in your tank is not sufficient, because you can have a tank full of gas, but your car is not going to start if somebody's stolen the starter motor, right? Or if, uh, uh, or if you've, you know, left your headlights on all night and the, the battery's dead. Uh, you can have a nice tank full of gas, but it will not be enough to guarantee your car starting. However, it is for sure true that your car will not start without that. Okay. So, both of the, what, the ideal definition of something like life will, will give you is a list of necessary conditions that are jointly sufficient. So, it gives you a list of things that you can't be alive without, and then when you put all four, uh, all of them, however many there are together, if something has all of those, then that guarantees it is alive. And so we saw, for example, uh, in this chapter, Aristotle has a list like nutrition and reproduction and motion and so on. However, uh, you can also undermine a necessity claim. As I've showed that you can undermine a sufficiency claim. You can show that something is not sufficient for something else if you can think of a thing that has the first thing without being the second thing you can show that something is not sufficient for something else. I'm, I'm sorry, you can show that something is not necessary uh, for something else if you can think of the second thing without the first thing. So, for example, last time I was talking about dogs. Is having four legs necessary for being a dog? No, because you can think of something that is a dog that doesn't have four legs, a three-legged dog. All right. That's the kind of nitpicking that Feldman proceeds to do. He says, let's look at all these things and let's test to see if this really fits with our intuitive grasp of what is alive. And he keeps coming up with examples. So merely having motion is not good enough because you can think of a lawn sprinkler. That shows that motion is not sufficient for life. Uh, and he ends up sort of basically saying this, this uh, life functional doesn't really work. It gets more and more, I mean, the, they improve and improve the definition till we get to what? LF6, life function 6. Um, X is alive at a certain time. By definition, if at that time X is able to exercise at least one capacity that is a vital function for its species. Well, um, that's when he brings in the example of the tree. For example, some evergreens have this feature. The seeds are in cones. 
The cones burst open only if exposed to very considerable heat. The heat is produced by forest fires. The forest fires occurs only if the old trees burn. Consider this property being able to burn. If most evergreens of the relevant sort lack this property, the species would die out. So that suggests that the property of burning is, vi is a vital function for the species of evergreen trees. Uh, well, by the LF6, that means you're alive if you're able to exercise that function. Well, if the function is burning, dead trees can exercise this function. So the definition, you're alive if you can exercise a vital function for your species, fails because exercising a vital function for your species is not sufficient to guarantee that you're alive because a dead tree can burn, so it, it exercises one of the life functions, but that doesn't show that it's alive because it's dead. Okay, so that's what he's doing in the life functional ones. All right, so the... The intuitive idea that living things are things that are able to do, perform a certain number of functions, didn't seem to work. All right, he says, let's try a different attack in chapter three, vitalist theories. Vitalist theories say, well, maybe, if it's, maybe being alive is not being able to do certain things, perform certain functions. Maybe what it is to be alive is to contain something special, some special kind of stuff. So, for example, Aristotle also had this kind of... Aristotle, by the way, was Plato's student. They had a real trifecta, uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. It's like the greatest uh, series of philosophers one after the other in history. Um, Aristotle also had this idea that uh, there are different kinds of souls. Now, these aren't necessarily the kind of souls that we're familiar with in, say, Christianity. Uh, incidentally, um, a lot of scholars believe that the idea of a soul that is familiar in Christianity comes from Plato. Uh, the, in fact, people who believed in souls back in the Middle Ages were called Christian Platonists because they they taken this idea of a soul from Plato. He talks about it, you know, hundreds of years BC. Um, Aristotle sort of adapts Plato's idea. Uh, he doesn't think he doesn't. Uh, Plato believes that the soul can be immortal. Uh, Aristotle doesn't think that. He thinks that um, basically you, uh, y when you die, you're dead. He doesn't believe in the possibility of immortality. However, he, b he believes there is this thing called the soul, and having it is what makes you alive. And uh, even for plants, plants have a very simple soul, though they, they only have what he calls a nutritive soul. So it has the, the most basic life functions, nutrition and reproduction. But it has it has a soul. So you know when you kill a plant, imagine this little soul leaving it. Um, don't kill plants. I guess you know even vegetarians have to kill plants, but only if you need to eat them. Um, so the vitalist idea is that there's this special kind of stuff that living things have, whether it be a soul, whether it be this vital fluid that he talks about, which was also a theory, and he dismisses that because, you know, what is it? I mean, there, if it's totally imponderable, that means, basically, in his view, it's bullshit. You know, the, if you can't see it and you can't detect it in any way, it's like invis invisible fairies or something, you know. If somebody sells, says you their invisible fairies are everywhere, but they're totally undetectable, and, and there's no way you could ever know that they were there, you know, crazy talk. Um, so if we're going to believe in vitalism, we need something a little bit better than that. And of course, the most recent idea is there's this stuff called DNA or RNA, because viruses, we want to say viruses are alive, and viruses, I, I believe it's viruses, don't have DNA. They have this thing called RNA, which isn't quite as sophisticated as DNA. Not a biology major, so you can correct me on that. But, you know, DNA or RNA, it's got to have one of those two things to be alive. Well, does it? Um, first of all, exactly when you say it's got to have DNA, exactly what do you mean? If you simply say it must contain DNA, well, he says, I've seen a test tube with DNA in it because, you know, his, his daughter worked in a lab and they separated out the DNA. Um, dead bodies have DNA in them. Even now, this isn't simply because they have living cells in them. They do. 
uh, you know, a lot of the cells take a while to die. Although, incidentally, that story about your fingernails growing after you die, that's false. That's one of those old wives' tales. I, I believe that. And your hair and fingernails is supposed to grow after you die. No, it doesn't. Actually, all that happens is that the flesh recedes and it appear, it makes your fingernails appear longer, but they're the same length. They stop growing when you, when you die. Um, so there is some living cells in your body shortly after you die, but pretty quickly they die too. But does the DNA go away? No, there's plenty of DNA. I mean, if you've seen uh, CSI, they can get DNA. I mean, they can get DNA from bones that have been, you know, dead for thousands of years. They they got they've got the DNA of a woolly mammoth, and they've been extinct for for thousands of years. So DNA does not disappear from dead things, which is a problem because if your definition of being alive is containing DNA. Well, dead things contain DNA, and they're not alive. So, it's merely containing DNA is not good enough. Well, clearly the DNA has to be active in some way. Well, what do you mean by active? You have to define active, you know, because maybe I got a mammoth bone and juggle with it. Oh, look, active DNA, but it's not alive. So, you have to define what you mean by active, you know, and you can't just say doing what DNA does, because that, what do you mean? Um, and the best he can come up with is uh, if the DNA is animating something. But of course this is a cheat, because what does animating mean? It means bringing to life. So in effect he's saying, uh, some, his definition of what it is to be alive is X is alive if X has stuff in it that makes it alive. Which of course is useless. It's like if I told you I'm going to define the term blurgle. X is blurgle if it blurgles. You know, I haven't told you anything. The definition is not informative. And that's the same problem that he ends up with that one. So, I understand how if you're a biology major, and I've had this argument actually with a biochemist here at UM Flint, that you have definitions in your biology, biology textbooks and you said, this is the definition of life, has DNA in it. Well, not good enough, says Feldman the philosopher. It might be a criterion, it might, uh, uh, well, for one thing, first of all, having DNA is not sufficient to be alive, because you can have DNA and be dead, but it's not even necessary. Now, maybe it's necessary for all the life that we've discovered, although, of course, we discovered viruses and we said, oh, crap, they don't have DNA in them. Okay, we'll expand the definition, DNA and this extra stuff, RNA. Well, imagine, you know, we finally meet ET, and turns out he doesn't have DNA in him. Do we say, oh, well, then you can't be alive? No, he's clearly alive. So what we then discover is that DNA is not necessary for life. You can be alive without having DNA. Well, how would we, why would we say that E.T. was alive? Well, because of what he does. He, you know, moves around and says, ouch, and, you know, makes bicycles fly and whatever, he's, and talks. He's clearly alive. Well, in that case, looks like we're going back to the life functional definition, because we're saying E.T. has to be alive because of all the things he does that are clearly... So, vitalism leads us back to life functional uh, definitions, and, you know, we're kind of back where we began. Well, this is frustrating. I mean, you might think, well, what's the point of all this? Well, Socrates famously said, um, uh, Socrates, there's a story told about Socrates that a friend of his visited the oracle at Delphi, and the oracle was this woman who used to live in a cave and, and speak for the gods. Uh, now, actually, there's a theory that she was high on these fumes that came up through a fissure in the bottom of her cave. They were sort of volcanic fumes, and including carbon monoxide. But, supposedly, she spoke for the gods, and a friend of, her, a friend of Socrates went to visit her and said, who is the wisest man? And she said, Socrates is. And Socrates professed to be surprised. He says, because look, I've always said, I don't know anything. How can I be the wisest man if I don't know anything? And then he says, perhaps this is what she meant. I'm the wisest because I know I know nothing. Whereas everybody else is going around thinking they know something when they don't. And I prove that every time I run into them and show that they're full of it. Um, so, Think of it this way, 
you can't make progress acting under false assumptions. So if you think you understand something when you really don't, you're, that's not progress. Progress has to begin with breaking down your assumptions. Like, if there's a definition that we're acting on and it's wrong, that has to be shown. And that's something like what um, Feldman is doing in, uh, in these chapters. Okay, the fourth chapter, he finally gets to death. And he says it starts with what he calls the gift of life, which is to say, let's pretend we actually came up with a definition of life because we're going to need to use the term life in our definition of de death. And he starts with the standard definition, uh, which is, you know, death is the end of life. And remember, of course, this is the biological concept of death. So what he means by that is anything, it should be true of anything that is alive. So my definition of death should work on, you know, um, the cactus that withers in my office the same as a person. Um, so it shouldn't be something very specific. Like you, sh you can't have a definition of death that says when your brain ceases to function because cacti don't have brains, but they can die. So he wants it to be a definition that will work for anything living, including one-celled organisms. And, you know, death is the end of life. That would work, because let's assume we have a definition of life that, that is biological, that works for one-celled organisms. Uh, of course, the end of life turns out to be not that simple, and he gives examples of suspended animation. And lest you think that these are two science fiction, first of all, that doesn't matter if it's a science fictional case, because for one thing, science fiction pretty rapidly becomes science fact. They're doing all kinds of things now that they never thought they could do, you know, even five years ago. But even if it, uh, even if some of the examples remain science fictiony. That doesn't mean we can't use the examples because, you know, suppose we never meet E.T. It's still in theory possible that E.T. could exist, in which case, um, you know, DNA would not be enough to show that something is alive. But secondly, they have actually done suspended animation on uh, various simple animals. I, they've done it on mice, I think. Uh, they've frozen mice and, and, you know, woken them up as well uh, later. and you know, it looks entirely possible that they will be able to do it on humans eventually, and because we'll need to do it so that we can get to Mars and recolonate it when we finally destroy the Earth. Um, okay, so the end of life uh, is not good enough because suppose you end your life by going into, you know, a suspended animation, and he says suspended animation is not living because you're not engaging any in any of the life functions. You know, you have, you have none of the signs of life. Um, somebody approaching you would not know whether you were alive or not. There would be no way to tell if you were alive or not in, a, in, sus in genuine suspended animation. You'd just be a block of stuff. Uh, so you're not actually alive, but you're not actually dead. Um, you haven't died because, in theory, you could they could revive you. So suspended animation creates a problem for the, the simple definition. And then he goes through all other kinds of com uh, problems, like, uh, like amoeba are alive, but what if an amoeba splits into two? Uh, it becomes two entirely new amoeba. What happened to Amos, which is his name for the original amoeba? Well, Amos doesn't exist anymore. Did he die? No, he didn't die. Uh, he passed out of life deathlessly. So if you say that uh, your definition of, of dying is ceasing to live, well, Amos died. But we don't want to say that Amos died. He didn't really die because uh, he just divided into two different things. Incidentally, if you think, well, I don't really care about amoeba. What does this have to do with anything that I care about? Think of the issue, this is actually an important issue, believe it or not, in the abortion debate. Um, twins. Uh, some people claim that life begins at conception. Uh, and again, this is a, a vague thing to say, because of course, 
life doesn't begin at conception because the sperm and the egg are biologically alive right they're not dead tissue they wouldn't become a zygote if they were dead they would just sit there they wouldn't merge so they're already alive so what is this life that begins when they join uh, it's not it's not the biological conception of life so what do you mean it uh, you mean a new individual life well in that case what happened to the sperm and the egg did they die did they cease to exist as separate entities this new life uh, is it are there now three things that are alive the sperm the egg and the person or is the person just the sperm and the egg in which case well the sperm and was where was the person when the sperm and the egg was separate was it just a divided person so as the person predated the uh, the joining of the sperm and the egg uh, well or you know once you, suppose you say okay well there's n new DNA when the sperm and egg well actually it's a little while after the sperm and the egg meet it's, it's like 24 hours later when the, their uh, gametes actually join um, it's called syngamy okay so syngamy happens we've got new DNA but a while after that twinning can happen okay so when do the twins start to exist do the twins not exist until they uh, until the egg splits into two in which case what happened to the person that supposedly started existing when syngamy happened did that person die and now there are two new persons or is one of them the person that already existed and the other one just started to exist or were they both the same person none of these suggestions seems very attractive so it's it's kind of a complicated issue and uh, I think we might get into that later however what he's doing in this is again trying to nail down exactly what it is to die um, and you might say well come on for for our purposes ceasing to live is good enough you're coming up with all these wacky examples but it isn't really good enough particularly um, you know suppose they they perfect suspended animation could somebody get tried for murder for putting someone into suspended animation say yo you killed him because when you threw that switch he ceased to live and the de legal definition of killing is to make someone cease to live uh, well that's wrong that clearly that wouldn't be right um, so anyway that's what he's up to it can't I think newcomers to philosophy think oh this is just nitpicking what the, what's the point of this whereas uh, philosophers <laughs> you know this is what we do we we um, we insist that terms must be incredibly clearly laid out and there must be no counterexamples otherwise otherwise chaos reigns you might say otherwise we don't know what we're saying if you only have a vague and fuzzy idea of what your words mean then how do you know people disagree with you uh, you don't really have a grasp on your concepts now that isn't all there is to philosophy working on definitions but it is an important part of philosophy and I think Feldman in these chapters does a good clear example of this thing which is called conceptual analysis and these are very basic central concepts that we're working with so that's why I sort of wanted to start with this. Um, I hope it, you, you don't find it too annoying. At least he comes up with some pretty interesting examples. Uh, you know, there's you. If you don't like the example you're working with now, you know, well, wait a page, and there's a whole new example, and you've got uh, you've got mice in cell separators and stuff like that. All right. Uh, I hope that will help for those of you who you know were struggling with the point of this and uh, also for those of you who are going to write a paper on this um, any questions email me use the discussion board don't use the discussion board for just saying you know uh, I you my computer crashed when I when I was in the middle of a test email me for stuff like that for you know kind of personal stuff 
but if you want to use the discussion board for saying, you know, I don't know, there's two discussion boards. There's one for discussing the subject matter, like, well, I disagree with this definition of death. Okay, use one of the, the discussion board for that. Or there's, you know, my bra in my browser I can't see the button for submit papers or something like, is anybody else having this problem? Uh, that's the kind of thing that should be in the discussion board. But if it's like strictly uh, an instructor, individual instructor student issue, then email me for that kind of stuff. All right, talk to you again soon.